Welcome, everybody, to episode three of the Time and Space podcast. I'm Jordan Hirsch. That's Francis Donald, and we got segment Sean Tandy in the building. Big W Productions is giving you this podcast today. We have a really special episode with one of our friends, Tiffany Saran. Francis, tell us a little bit about Tiffany and our connection to Dallas, Chris Saran. How do we get this episode? Yeah, going? Tiffany Saran is the uh, operations behind um, what I consider to be the best, the strongest, the most valuable lacrosse program, club lacrosse program in Texas, Iron Horse Lacrosse. Um, she and her husband, Chris, um, who you may know from the 90s in Syracuse, he was a goalie um, there when they won the national championship. Was it 1993 over UNC? Am I out of bounds there? Somebody fact check me. Um, Tiffany and Chris have been living in uh, in Dallas for, I think they said, 15 years um, or so and um, have created an opportunity for um, young kids that are going through the Catholic school system to feed into um, one of the bigger schools there. They've created camp opportunities for uh, the local community. Um, Jordan, Chris Rand, and I um, all met at Players' Choice Lacrosse Camp uh, in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, something we've referenced before. Um, and through our coaching career and my career as a coach after, um, Chris has become a mentor for us and a friend. Um, and we were really excited to um, not interview Chris tonight, but uh, interview Tiffany, um, somebody who is uh, identifies herself as a, a mom, um, a mom of uh, three boys, a lacrosse mom uh, in some regards, or maybe not. Um, but an organizer, a lacrosse organizer, certainly. So we're going to hear from her, hear her story, um, her life in lacrosse, um, and some of the things she likes to do outside of the game. What we love about this episode is we're taking someone who deserves a ton of credit, like many of the lacrosse parents out there that are behind the scenes, and we're putting them in front of the camera to totally. share their story. And everyone be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you can also find us at the time and space podcast.com. Uh, be sure to follow us and download Apple Music and Spotify wherever you get your podcasts. We want to welcome everybody to the third episode of the time and space podcast. Jordan Hirsch, Francis Donald, and we are here with Tiffany Saran logging in with us from Dallas, Texas, and we appreciate your time and being here with us. And as we do, uh, we're going to start off with a fit check. So I'm going to go first today. Uh, I have my Hartford Whalers vintage uh, sweater. Um, I've already gotten a compliment on it, which I'm very excited about. And uh, I pulled this one out of the closet. Uh, my wife, Jen, used to work for the Bruins, the Boston Bruins. And she got this for me from their pro shop uh, a while back. So this was a, a good good find and a good gift. Um, and I'm matching it with my Legends hat. Yes, I did go ahead and buy a Legends hat after Francis told me to buy a Legends hat. Because as usual, whatever he tells me to do fashion-wise, I just do it without asking. Um, so that's what I'm going with today. Francis, you want to go next? Yeah, I'll follow that up with, I am also wearing my Legends tie-dye hat that I had on. Uh, that was so persuasive that Jordan had to go out and get his own. And then I've got a, uh, a simple Bishops Knights t-shirt, um, maroon. Our Bishops is the school that I work at here in San Diego, California. Um, I've been a varsity lacrosse coach for them, but my favorite role that here um, in athletics is I'm a middle school lacrosse coach. So repping the Knights today. Um, Maroon and gold, that's what we bleed out here. So um, happy to happy to show off the tee. Tiffany, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've got on here? Absolutely. And thanks for having <laughs> me, guys. Um, very flattered that you asked. Um, I'm wearing an Iron Horse sweatshirt with oh. hockey laces. And, <laughs> Can we see um, the logo? Can you tip the, tip the let's screen? Let's see. Yep, there you oh, go. With the nice. cursive, the script. Yep, I like the that. Yep, the cursive. Okay. Um, wearing jeans, and I have <laughs> no shoes on because it's about 75 here. 
What? <laughs> Dallas wow. problems. Now, yeah. Tiffany, you relate to Jordan's jersey. Can you tell us how? Yes, I love his jersey. I'm partially from Hartford. I grew up there from when I was 15 till I left for college. Um, went to Avon High School. And the whale was big in, uh, in Hartford <laughs> at the time. So I immediately recognized the jersey and had to give him a shout out. To open this up, we'd love to get a little bit of your background. Um, are, are you from Connecticut originally? Now you're in Dallas. How, how long have you been in Texas and where were you before that? So um, I am not from Connecticut originally. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia originally. Um, my stepfather was in international business and lived in Singapore for three years, which was amazing growing up. That was from the middle of seventh grade to uh, sophomore year in high school. And then, like I said, I finished up high school in Connecticut and um, ended up going to Southern Methodist University, ironically, hey. in Dallas for a year <laughs> before I transferred to Syracuse because of my major. And um, so from Syracuse, we lived in uh, Newport, Rhode Island for four years and then back to Syracuse when my husband was in law school and uh, straight from law school to Dallas. So we've been here now for um, 21 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. I don't know if I knew that whole progression. So that's really Probably great not. Hear. Yeah. <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Nice. And now you have, um, you have three sons, correct? Yes. And can yes. you tell us their, their ages and stages of life? So my oldest, Christopher, is about to turn 24 in a few weeks. He wow. graduated from Washington and Lee, where he played lacrosse. Um, he graduated during 2020. So, you know, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Um, my middle son, Colby, is a junior in college. And my son, Hart, is 10. And he's in fourth grade here locally in Dallas at a, at a Catholic school. It's funny when you logged in, we said heart, huh? I wonder who that is. They must be in the wrong zoom and how, how amazing, right? And as a teacher, I can appreciate this. And, and Francis too, as an educator, amazing that kids 10 years old and younger are operating zoom at, at this level. Uh, and, and so often, so amazing that, that now the connection is made. Yes, um, Hart, Hart is the only one that has used Zoom on my computer. I can verify until <laughs> until this. Yes. Yeah. I just want to give you a, a shout out, Tiff, because um, we had talked a little bit about this opportunity last week. But essentially what happened is that I called you yesterday and I said, can you do this podcast tomorrow? Um, and very smoothly and very calmly, you said yes. And now that you're on it, you're also very smooth and very calm. Um, what, are you nervous at all about this opportunity or is this, you know, pretty, pretty chill? No, I'm fine. It's yeah, I'm <laughs> fine with the opportunity. I really, thanks for thinking of me. I'm, I'm, as you know, Francis, a very behind the scenes, uh, right. person in what I do. So, um, you know, it's just nice to be thought of every now and then. Absolutely. Well, that was the main reason we, we wanted to, to get you on uh, this podcast to really find out um, someone like you who not only is a lacrosse parent, but also your significant other has his own life in lacrosse and is a lacrosse coach. Why don't you tell us all the different hats that you wear when it comes to the game of lacrosse um, and thinking professionally and personally? Sure. So um, first and foremost, I'm a mom and mm -hmm. I have definitely um, supported all three of the kids in their lacrosse endeavors. Christopher, as you know, he went on to play collegiately, played all the way through high school and then college, actually suffered a career ending concussion when he was a junior. So that was over. But then um, Colby played through eighth grade. Um, and then when he went to high school, the first couple of weeks he was there, 
he uh, he talked to the cycling coach and the cycling coach, he was just came home all excited. He's like, mom, I just really want to try this during the fall. I'll play lacrosse in the spring, but this just seems really cool and I want to do it. So um, six years later, he's never looked back from cycling. He does road cycling. He does um, mountain biking. Um, he's done cyclocross. So he's really wow. into that. He rides every day. He rode today. Um, so he loves to cycle. So that was great. Honestly, it was probably, it's the best thing for him. So lifetime sport. Um, and Hart is um, 10 and he is in fourth grade. He just played his first select fall season. Um, okay. And that was funny. He's decided to take up the position of goalie. Yeah. So <laughs> that's interesting. Being a goalie mom is definitely different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's one hat I wear. Um, obviously, I, you know, I supported Chris when he was playing that senior season in Syracuse. Uh, watched all of his games, at least his home games, went to a few away games. That was super fun. They won the national championship that year. So, I mean, that was pretty much as good as it gets. Um, then we, um, you know, long, long, he, he got the job with the Naval Academy Prep School in Newport right out of college where they commissioned him to be an officer in the United States Navy um, so that he could coach their lacrosse team in Newport, um, that gap year team that they have up there at the prep school. And, um, that was awesome. I mean, living there for four years and, uh, you know, he was an officer in the Navy, so he had all the medical benefits and everything that came along wow. with it. That was amazing. Um, then, um, took a long break after that, after that, after that ended, because, uh, when he decided to go back to law school, he decided he was going to put the coaching gig aside and that we were going to, he was going to go to law school. So we moved back to Syracuse and uh, he did that. Um, and then, you know, worked here in Dallas for 10 years, maybe. I probably not, no, not 10, because we're going on 15, I guess, that we've been doing. Worked in Dallas a good eight years as an attorney at a high powered firm. Um, and did lacrosse, did lessons, you know, here and there, nothing big started coaching Christopher when he was in third grade um, that like you couldn't start lacrosse here any younger than that at the time. It was, that right. was, that was like really too young to start lacrosse because they primarily started in fifth at that point. But um, so he did that. And then from there, um, you know, 2008 happened with the everything going on and um his firm hadn't been doing so well, so he decided, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, this Jesuit job opened up and people thought we were crazy and we probably were <laughs> because we just ditched the whole law thing and uh, he started coaching at Jesuit. And so that's when I started just like, well, we have to have a youth feeder program. So like I started forming teams primarily and initially for my own children. And then, um, you know, it just kind of blew up and very quickly it blew up and we had a lot of teams and um, for the rec program that's called the Dallas Deuces um, at Jesuit. Um, other roles I've played, I've been on the board for the Youth League here. I was on it uh, for a good five years in a row. Um, I was also on the junior Dallas Rattlers board for the brief period of time oh, wow. that they were in town. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, that's it. Well, we started Iron Horse, as you know, Francis, because that's when yeah. you came along and um, and we have the select thing going now. So basically, I divide my time between the rec program and the rec season, which is the spring uh, which is the Dallas Deuces, and then Iron Horse, which is the summer and the fall, uh, which is the select program. How many players would you say go through in any given year the Deuces and Iron Horse program combined? And I know there's crossover, but any any ballpark? 
Um, yeah, I would definitely say if, if I'm combining them about 900. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you're managing the, the back end of that experience, right? And, yes. And I yeah. have help and I have help too. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it on my own, um, anymore. I have, um, obviously Chris does a lot. Um, I have a lady that has helped me with the deuces. She's a Jesuit parent for, for several years, Suzanne Moran. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you remember Suzanne. And yeah. then, um, I also, Chris Del Faust is, um, oh, yeah. down in Austin and, uh, he coaches at Lake Travis. He, he's a very good, like coach slash admin guy. I, I, after the years of years of doing this, there's not a lot of coaches who necessarily can take the admin hat on and do it what do both well but he's definitely one of those guys that is organized on and off the field and can get things done in an admin fashion because I definitely could not handle all of this on my own with with when we added Houston uh like 18 months ago and right out of the shoot they were big because I guess you know I mean, name, name recognition. So it was, I knew I could, I knew I could not do that without help. Wow. That's incredible. That is incredible. So, I, so, I want to, oh, sorry, Jordan, go ahead. I was, I was going to ask, so it started just in Dallas. Yes. And how, how many different um, cities and, and maybe even states, because I'm pretty sure you, you've kind of dipped into Oklahoma as well. Is that right? No, we're primarily in Texas. Um, we okay. we th don't do anything in Oklahoma, but we are in Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Um, all okay. bo all boys teams. Austin is the only city that has girls. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes so I I, there are kids from Oklahoma who might come too. That is correct. But they're yes. that, right. But I think that's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. So you've seen essentially the rise of lacrosse in Texas. You've seen it from kind of a beginning stage and how much it's boomed. Um, do you see it that way or is it just the way I'm hearing it? It just sounds like it really exploded with some of the club opportunities. Yes, so it's funny that you say that because I tell people all the time that in one of my my maybe my second season of um when once we once Chris was at Jesuit and initially I think the very first season we called ourselves the Jesuit youth um very quickly Chris my husband who's an attorney decided you know said we've we've got to get Jesuit's name off of this this is probably <laughs> not a good idea and so that's when we decided to come up with the da the name Dallas Deuces but the very first Dallas Deuces season, I remember sitting around a table with about 10 other parents um, who were all in charge of their, their program scheduling games. And that was it. That was, that was it. That was, that was all oh. there were. And we did it all, you know, while eating dinner at California Pizza Kitchen. So um, <laughs> great spot. It, it, it's it's funny because I mean, you if if you've been to one of our um, our scheduling meetings, they're not like that anymore. They they take place in a huge conference room, you know, and and we have probably I would say seventy five people that attend. I want to take a second and and talk about Iron Horse um, because while it it is grounded in Texas, um, it is it's much bigger than that. Um, and you know Jordan has had an opportunity to interact with Iron Horse as a coach. Um, some of the kids that he's coached in New York have played for Iron Horse. Um, and I certainly have, I hope when you talk about coaches that can do admin, I hope that I'm in that bucket. You um, are. <laughs> because I spent a lot of my first couple years in Dallas, um, also working with you and working with Chris and, and doing a lot of the back end work. Um, what is, what is Iron Horse 
essentially? You know, what is it designed to do? Um, and, and what is it, how does it, you know, relate to some of the, the East Coast club programs like Long Island Sting or Mad Lax or Crabs, some of those names that you hear out there? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I think it's one of the bigger clubs in Texas, if not the biggest at this point, just the fact that we're in, you know, all the cities. Um, we really strictly do recruiting events at the high school level. Um, so all those clubs that you mentioned, uh, you know, we play them all the time. We don't, we don't go to events to win at the high school level to win trophies or to, you know, have a six and zero or five and zero, uh, you know, win loss record. We have to go to the tough events because my husband's passion really is helping kids get to the next level. If they want to play college lacrosse. That is, he wants to help them do that. And uh, he's he's good at that. So, you know, he, he, he just, he enjoys helping the kids um, realize their potential and, um, you know, living their dream if, if they, you know, want to do that. Absolutely. One thing I, I and I'll, I'll piggyback off of this because I really, I was an outsider looking in on, on this. One thing I really admired about the Iron Horse program is, and I'm sure you do a lot of the scheduling for this, and I know when Francis was working there, uh, working with Iron Horse, he did a lot of uh, individual skill sessions. And I know Chris does a lot of individual skill sessions. Um, I think that's such a great model when you're talking about trying to get kids to go to the next level. You're not just bringing them to a tournament to showcase them, you're building them to that tournament, which I think is so, um, you know, so great. And it really shows you're investing in, in the kids. And that's, that's putting, you know, what you just said, that's really showing that it's backed up with, with your program, which is really cool. We definitely have an extensive practice schedule for our high school players, um, our youth as well, but our um, you know, our high school players have a lot of practices. Um, and as you just mentioned, we offer a separate thing that's skill sessions and they're, you know, they're open to the, just the general public. Anybody can sign up, even if you're not part of our club. Um, and you know, they're the fee for the, the fee to do that is nominal really, to be honest with you. And it's really the cornerstone of our program. I mean, that's where the kids, you know, are hopefully getting better and completely falling in love with the sport is doing those skill sessions. It's, um, you know, we keep, we keep, uh, the ratio low and, um, you know, like the goalie, for example, I mean, five to one ratio. I mean, you know, it's, it's small and, uh, you know, it's like the attack and D I think is about 15 a piece. So, um, the kids really get a lot out of that if they if they do it and they come, for sure. One of the things that we always like to talk about when I was coaching, um, working for you, working for Chris, is that the value, right, the money that you're paying for Iron Horse, the value is in the practices. And yes. we, you show up to practice and it's not just one coach rolling a ball out and blowing the whistle. There are six coaches there and they're splitting you up into different positional places on the field and you spend the first half of your practice doing a designed positional workout before you get into any team, uh, into any scrimmaging activities. And that's such a, a different model than a lot of clubs out there. A lot of clubs out there are, are pay to play. You come to one or two practices, you go to a tournament, right? You try to win. And this is really the flip side of that because the hard message that families had to sometimes hear was that when you get to a tournament, not everybody is going to play an equal amount. Um, yes. and, and, and parents sometimes connect the idea of I'm paying, so I should be playing, um, which to a certain degree, that's right. But if your kid's not showing up to practice, your kid's not getting better. And if your kid's not getting better, your kid's not showing up well on the field. And I think you and Chris do a great job of building that expectation into your program. Um, yeah. Has that always been intentional? Um, well, yes, I would say definitely. I mean, but the, the kids, the coaches do do a good job about getting the kids fairly equal playing time. If it's a tournament that's got a playoff structure, 
um, then they definitely will play to win in that. And mm-hmm. so the bench might get shortened and there won't be equal playing time in that. But um, as far as like during the seeding round, I would say that they do. Um, we had a phenomenal turnout this summer and um, this fall at our, at our, especially our youth practices. It was, the kids were really invested and, and really out there. And, you know, I know it was a hard time for people. So everyone was just happy to be back out on the field. But, um, you know, we, we had just the be- probably the best turnout we'd ever had at the youth level, which was great. How much of what you have built is stems from identifying a need in a market or stems from you wanting to provide an experience for your son, sons, um, or just wanting to grow the game of lacrosse? Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up because yes, it grew out of the fact that my kids wanted to play. But it's funny because back in those days, in the beginning, you know, when when lacrosse was really growing in the Dallas Fort Worth area. What year would this be? Just this to, would to, to be, um, let's see, 15 years ago. So night. Okay. So yeah. So 2005 ish. Um, yeah. Um. So back when we were, it was really booming and growing, the people that sat around that table at California Pizza Kitchen were all basically, you know, they were very involved in getting their friends, their kids' friends to play lacrosse. And so everybody was just trying to, you know, grab everybody they can. Hey, come try this great sport. And um, and it was like a sense of community in that way where it was very much, um, you know, everyone was trying to grow the game. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's definitely changed in this area. Um, and numbers have, you know, declined here for the past maybe three or four years at the, at the youth level. I'm not sure of the high school level. I really can't speak to that. But since I'm so involved in the youth level of lacrosse, um, while my own program has not suffered any type of decline, a lot of the other programs in the area have. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, that the parents that are the ones like we were that were pioneering and they were just, you know, trying to grab the kids. They're not trying to do that anymore. Instead, they're trying to figure out how they can make Johnny's team the best team to win the city championship. And um, so that's a big thing that's definitely changed um, since the early days when so many of us were just so gung ho to grow the game. And I have talked to the youth league in the area um, several, for several years now, you know, this has got to be a point of focus for us. I mean, we really need to grow the game. I, I do wear two hats in the game of lacrosse as far as just from my admin perspective. I'd run the deuces, which is that rec program that feeds into, um, Jesuit College Preparatory School in Dallas. And then I run Iron Horse, which is a select program. So the Deuces competes against, competes against all these city teams and other school teams. So Plano West, Highland Park, St. Mark's, where you are from, Francis, and then ESD. Um, but I rely in the do I, I rely on the Iron Horse side for all of those programs to grow their numbers because right. that's just more kids that are gonna do our Iron Horse teams and all of that. So um, I've been a big, I've, I've, I've tried to, um, you know, hopefully, you know, get people to notice the numbers are slipping year to year in and year out, like going down and down and down. And I know that everybody sees the Dallas market as this booming lacrosse market. Um, but the fact of the matter is we have decreased our, uh, our, at least our youth numbers in the past several years, every year they go down a little bit more. And so I wish we could all get back to that mentality of with, with Hart's team, like for example, we did, we did just that. We grabbed all of his friends and we formed a team for his, you know, for his, um, his school. So, you know, keep the kids together. Yeah. Keep the kids together because friends get other friends to play lacrosse. So, you know, I mean, 
So yeah, we, we keep them together and you know what? We maybe go 50, 50 during the season and that's okay. You know, we got a lot of kids playing lacrosse and they're having fun doing it. And to be honest with you, I wish we could all get back to that here in the Metroplex. Um, it's become a lot about winning and mm. less about grow the game. And we need to get back to the grow the game part of it. It's a really important point. And I second that as somebody that came from that area and, and knows that it, you're, you're speaking the truth um, about Dallas and, and that's sort of a Dallas mentality in general. Um, and, uh, you know, wanting to be the best right at, at any cost. Um, and uh, I think those of us who have experiences grounded in the East Coast and lacrosse um, see the game a little bit differently. Um, and, uh, and really just like you said, want kids to play. We want to grow yeah. the game. Yes, exactly. So we've talked uh, a lot about your your multiple hats in Iron Horse and in youth lacrosse in, in the Dallas and Fort Worth area. What is life like off the field with your family? Um, just for you personally, getting away from lacrosse, doing stuff outside the game. What are the things that you would like to do not involving lacrosse? <laughs> I like to shop. Um, I'm not going to lie. I haven't done a lot of it this year, obviously. Um, I like to play tennis. Um, I also have not played a ton of tennis this year. Um, love to uh, go to art galleries. Oh. And um, sometimes, I, well, this actually, something that came out of the pandemic that was really great was I... I formed a love of cooking, which I had never had before. Wow. I, uh, baking, cooking, as long as my kids have been and my husband have been really great about trying new things. And my only complaint was, I just don't want to make the same thing over and over again. So um, obviously, we did a lot of cooking this year. But, yeah. um, you know, so that was good that I at least learned to enjoy it, which I can't say that I ever uh, have before. So what are the specialties? What do you, what do you, what were your favorites to make? Or, and um, then what were the favorites for the others to eat? So, um, we learned how to sous vide steaks and this was amazing. So there is a, I, do, do you need me to go into this great explanation? I don't know. What the, I don't know okay. what that is. Well, <laughs> sous vide. You can buy a, a sous vide device and stick it on a pan basically you 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 put your steak in a bag uh airtight bag and you put it in this pan for let's say 90 minutes on a certain temperature and then all you have to do basically your steak is really done and this is how the steak houses wow. do their steaks when you get it out you basically pan sear it on a cast iron pan and it is about the most amazing thing you will ever eat in your wow. life yeah, you need this device. You can get it at Williams Sonoma, <laughs> and you're all set. <laughs> hence the shopping. <laughs> yeah, hence the shopping. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that was good. I also um, started watching Jennifer Garner's cooking show, and uh. she is uh, always cooking something fun. So we were watching it one day, and everybody said, Mom, why don't you make some bagels? So bagels became like wow. a weekly pandemic food uh, and they are amazing, like unbelievable bagels that Whoa. they take a long time to make, like, <laughs> like three hours, but wow. really, really fun. And I got it and I got it down. Flavors. So, what are we, what are we yeah. doing for? Oh, um, so Chris's favorite is sea salt. Um, yeah. Christopher and I like uh, sesame seed. Colby likes cinnamon sugar. Um, and Hart's not a real big bagel guy, so he really wasn't doing the bagel thing. So Jordan's yeah. a bagel guy. Jordan, you're a bagel guy, right? I, I'm a big bagel. I, I think if you live, uh, you know, an an hour somewhere outside of New York City, you have to be a bagel guy. Yeah. Or or gal, <laughs> you got it. You got to be into bagels. Um, <laughs> and homemade bagels. I mean, you're not going to beat that. You're not yeah. going to beat that for sure. They're uh, amazing, and, and right? When they come out of the oven. 
Yeah. Uh, that well, oh. you, if you go to the deli, you got to get there at the right time so you can get it, <laughs> you know, fresh out of the Literally everyone in in the office right now is like their mouth is watering just cuz you're <laughs> right now. We might all go out to dinner after this. And I'm sure that um I've been anytime I've gone out with Chris, um the food is amazing. I remember yes. going to Dallas, working one of the camps and we went to uh, every night was, you know, all you could eat, as much as you could eat, and just amazing food. So I'm sure whatever you're making is delicious because he has a uh, an exceptional palate. So <laughs> if, if he's into it, I'm sure it's delicious. I actually I was I was out to dinner with my girlfriend a couple weeks ago, and we were at a nice restaurant, and they had a thirty eight dollar old fashioned on the okay. menu. Okay. And you see where I'm going with this. And, yes. and, 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 and your husband, Chris Saran, was, was the first person to present the old fashioned to me. And I think, Jordan, I think you were there too. And, that is and the way in, he presented in Chinatown. it was that you can always <laughs> tell uh, the quality of a bartender, um, of a mixologist by how they make an old fashioned. And every since, ever since then, I've been obsessed with getting an old fashioned wherever we go. Um, and even if they're $38, apparently. Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a splurge. I don't usually uh, do that, but okay. Yeah. Yes. That, that was a very expensive old fashioned. You know, we yes. haven't, we haven't partaken in the old fashioned in quite a while. No. Okay. No, well, no. I, I sent him a picture, but, um, <laughs> yeah. um, can I, can I ask you a serious question though? Um, do you ever get sick of lacrosse? Yes. <laughs> that was do you want to think answer. about it or <laughs> of course i do it's some sometimes i just feel like i can't get away from it um you know and this year was hard um you know we went we 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 never we had a oh not even did we not get a break in between the summer and fall iron horse season we had an overlap of about two weeks summer mm. overlapped with fall wow. about two weeks so we had our summer, uh, which, you know, we were very thankful to get the majority of our summer in. Uh, honestly, we didn't get all of our high school tournaments in. We were quarant, you know, how the quarantine was happening. And we were quarantined out of a few states uh, coming from Texas that we that we could not enter at the last minute. And so we couldn't do those tournaments. But um, yeah, I mean, when you don't get a break like that and you just roll from, you know, one thing to the next to the next it's it, it does it does get tough um we're not having our big holiday camp this year because of the ncaa uh dead period which has now been extended through april 15th wow. so um yeah so that uh we are going to get a break this christmas so yeah. we're we're really looking forward to that as a family Can you tell us what, can you go a little brief synopsis on what the Deuces Holiday Camp is? Because this is a, it, it's a unique experience that you all have put together. I'm going to give you a chance to plug it here. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a phenomenal camp. Um, we started having it. Um, I don't know. They, they had, je the, the old Jesuit lacrosse coach before Chris had a holiday camp where he just used, um, I think his high school players. So when Chris came on board, he wanted to do something different. And we started bringing in these college guys. It started very slow. Um, you know, I think the first year we had one guy and then the next year we had five. And then after that, it just grew and grew and grew. But they were all college coaches. Um, and if you look at our staff last year, I mean, you know, we had like eight D1 head coaches. Um, wow. You know, Jerry Byrne always comes. Ryan Wellner always comes. He's, you know, an assistant. He was at Navy and now he's at Notre Dame. Um, you know, we have we have phenomenal coaches. Coach DeVoe, which I know you know, uh, Francis from Dallas. You know, he he always comes back and comes to it. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable, you don't get to see, these coaches don't get to be with you on the field at a normal event. But in this circumstance, they are on the field with these kids. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's just, I mean, I, I, I don't 
know how we don't have a gazillion kids from all over the country, <laughs> but it is at, at a kind of an awkward time right before Christmas. It's literally like basically the kids get out of school on a Friday usually and it's or whatever and it starts on a, you know, a Friday night and goes uh, that night, Saturday and Sunday and it's over. And then sometimes it's the 23rd on the last day and then people, you know, have to scatter. But um, so it does happen in an awkward time, but it, it's really quite unbelievable. Um, and we've been doing it for about, gosh, I think this was going to be our 15th annual. Um, wow. So yeah, when we canceled, but well, we, we just never, we didn't cancel it. We just never, we never, we talked about it early on. What are we going to do? And of course we could have done the film thing that was happening over the summer and had, you know, D3 coaches in attendance. Um, but we just decided, you know what, we're going to, we're going to take a, a year off and we'll be back next year, refreshed and ready to go. <laughs> right. But in the meantime, Merry Christmas. You don't have to work those that yes. not weeks, months work uh, yes. leading up to it. And I definitely um, do not like lacrosse at that time <laughs> leading up to the holiday camp because I'm so stressed about as a mom, I'm just so stressed about Christmas in general, but, you know, procrastinating. Nobody has presents and having to run out and do all that. And then, you know, I've got this holiday camp looming over my head. Um, I do have it fairly down to a science now, so I, you know, I, I can, I can whip it. I can whip that check in together pretty quick and, <laughs> and, uh, organize those jerseys. But, you know, I, I, and it's really, it is always fun to see everybody every year. We, we have people that have literally been coming since first grade and then they're, you know, they're, they're in high school and it's, it's really nice to see the same old faces every year that you, you see. So, and just get to talk to them, which I enjoy doing after check-in is over on day one, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I, I think my first time in Dallas was for that camp. We, um, Francis said, Chris, we, we had, we had all met Chris and Francis and I had all met working at players choice camp. Uh, oh yeah. In, okay. In, uh, in Massachusetts. And, I think when Francis and I had first started coaching uh, not too long after college, uh, Francis shot me a text and he's like, Chris runs this camp in Dallas. We got to go. We got to go. <laughs> it's it's going to be amazing. And I'm like, all right, yeah, cool. So we, we got our flights and went out to Dallas. It was – not only was it so much fun to coach, um, and, and I echo the talent coaching-wise was so high. I, I was in awe of a lot of the guys that I was standing next to, coaching next to uh, as a young coach. But the enthusiasm to play uh, amongst the kids was incredible. And it was so fun to coach. Um, great time at night. There was something for us as young guys to do every single night. And then we'd get up in the morning and coach. Um, just a really great experience for everybody. So I would echo that as well. It was so much fun. And, and as a guy from New York who, you know, I, I was in that tri-state bubble really until I moved to Virginia to coach. And then I went to Dallas. I was like, oh, my God, there's lacrosse here. This is amazing. You know, like <laughs> it, was, it was great well, to see it. It was great to be a part of it. Gone are the days when they go to the Jay Z concert, which happened one year. <laughs> that was us. And yeah, and uh, let's see, Mav Sweet, the Maverick Sweet, yep. or went they, to the Stars the Cowboys one year. It's probably too um, many guys now. Stars, to do all that stuff. no, no, that's not the that's not what happened. What everybody's aging out. <laughs> They're oh. just like, <laughs> they are tired and, you know, they, yeah. they, they love a good meal. So, um, yeah. you know, we still do a really great meal. The past couple of years we've had, um, a Christmas party at our house and oh, that's cool. been really oh, fun awesome. for, for all, for all of us. And honestly, they, they kind of just enjoy, um, hanging out together, to be honest with you. They uh, they like the they like the house thing better than the the really fancy restaurant only because after the meal's over they can still kind of kick back and just talk to one another and they really do enjoy that camaraderie of of just kind of getting to kick back and hang out a little bit together you know even though you know they're competing for the same kids sometimes in the recruiting world <laughs> they 
a lot of them, it's a small, obviously lacrosse is a pretty small community. And I think they really all enjoy just getting to spend that time hanging out with one another. It, I, and I don't know if you realize this, but that camp was a, a stop on the recruiting trail. Um, and it wasn't even recruiting, right? That was the beauty of it. It's like, you could just have fun. But as a coach, a college coach, which we both were at L Jordan at Lynchburg and myself at, at Nazareth, that was a place that we wanted to go because other guys that we loved being around were also going. And so it became, are you going this year? Yeah, I'm going. It's like, sweet, we're going to have a great time. And other guys being like, I want to go to that. And we're like, no, nah, you can't. <laughs> we're full. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, as, as you know, it's not a recruiting camp because no, it, ta it, ta not. <laughs> it takes place during an NCAA quiet period, but yeah. um, they are they are there um, on the field with the kids and, and they're coaching them and it's a teaching camp, but it's a great yes, camp. I, let's rephrase that. It is 100% <laughs> not a recruiting camp. Um, I just meant that the only camps that you get to see other coaches at are recruiting camps. So it sort of gets lumped in with that group, but not yes. a recruiting camp. <laughs> and, and, do, and doesn't that actually go back to that point of, you know, let's circle back to what this game's all about, right? These college coaches are, are really, uh, their lifeblood is in recruiting, and they don't actually get a chance to work with high school kids often and really teach the game at that level, and on top of that, have a great experience for themselves with other coaches where they can just be social. So uh, providing that outlet is, is really great. And that's really one of the reasons why they, you know, they come back every year. And I mean, they, they really do enjoy it because they, they don't get to do that anymore. That's what they continue to tell us and, and everything. And they wish more, more camps would be, you know, like this. And sometimes we can give them some good weather, which they're thankful for coming <laughs> from mostly the Northeast. And sometimes we yeah, can give them the cold. 30s. We um, want to take a, a pivot here and just ask you this very basic question, but that's very layered. And what does it mean to be a lacrosse mom? You know, that is a phrase that is sort of heralded and thrown around the game. Um, it's a very, uh, very distinct descriptor. What does it mean to you to be a lacrosse mom? I don't know. I don't really, I don't really see myself as a lacrosse mom so much. Um, I, I, cause I just, I organize it. I, it was funny. We, I was just at one of hearts tournaments. Um, it was the very last one of the fall and they played in the championship game. And after the game, someone on the other team came up to me and said, cause I talk, I, I talked to the ref, gave him a big hug, um, you know, at halftime and, and they were like, um, you shouldn't have been talking to that ref. And I was like, okay. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, it was, it was just awkward. I, I just, I, I know so many people and, um, I don't see myself as a lacrosse mom per se. I just, I feel like I'm an organizer that happens to be a mom that mm -hmm. has a kid playing lacrosse. I, I, I don't really see myself as a lacrosse mom, but some, but I, there are some pretty crazy lacrosse moms out there. <laughs> you want to talk about that? <laughs> I don't know if we want to name any names, but uh, <laughs> what do you, um, what do you see from parents out there in the game of lacrosse right now? Youth parents, um, what's your perspective the, on, just, on their behavior? You know, I mean, I think for the most part, they try to be good. They yell at the refs too much and they, they need to stop that because it just doesn't help anything. Um, you know, I think, like I said, for the most part, they, they try to be good, but, um, they, they just get a little carried away sometimes in the, in the heat of the moment. And, uh, you know, uh, use the 24 hour rule. It's always good to <laughs> use that. <laughs> Yeah. Coach um, Hurst, you agree? Can you, can, I was going to say, could you just say that one more time? Just so everybody is very clear on that. I, I think that's the best. That is the best. Yeah. The what is the 24-hour rule? For what, those who what may is, not know. Yeah, what is the 24-hour rule? Um, if you have any kind of grievance after, you know, a tournament weekend or when whatever, 
um, you know, don't file fire off an email on on Sunday at 5 p.m. the second you walk in the door from the tournament, you know. Wait until Monday at 5 p.m. and see, you know, see how you feel. You usually do feel a little bit different. Honestly, our parents were fantastic this summer and fall. And I, and I think they were just grateful. They they were just grateful to have their kids back out there. I mean, yeah, there there were incidents and I think there's there are always going to be incidents, but um our parents were, you know, for the most part really really great. Um you know, it it's, it was a tough time and people were just happy to be back on the field. Yeah. Well, hopefully that gives uh you know, this period of time that's so unique and and different will give some people some perspective on on how fortunate we can be to do the things that we love to do when we're able to do them uh, more normally, hopefully very soon. Um, but 24 hour rule, write it down, everybody. It's, it, yes. it's real. It's a real thing. It has to do with the fact that you have a son who decided to play college lacrosse. Um, you have a son who played some lacrosse growing up and decided to lean into cycling and you have a younger son who is now getting into his lacrosse life. When you think about the game of lacrosse and how it has impacted your three sons um, in a variety of ways, um, you know, how are you grateful for this sport to have, you know, been a part of their journey and, um, and how is it, how has it led them in different ways? That's a really big question. That is a big question. Um, you know, like, you know, you all, you know about my oldest and, you know, playing in college and that led him to Washington and Lee. He was originally going to go to the University of Texas. Um, and I'm grateful that he got to have that experience. And um, I'm actually really grateful that he got to have that PG year experience at Salisbury. Um, that's not talked about very much, but honestly, that was a phenomenal experience for him. I mean, truly, um, you know, if you are on the fence thinking about that as an option based on his experience, I, I just, I wouldn't even hesitate. Um, wow. you know, I mean, it was, it was really a great experience. He went to Salisbury school and was coached by Bobby Wynn. And he just loved it. I mean, he loved he loved being there, and he loved the kids um, at the school. So that was great. Colby, my middle. I mean, so thrilled. Not not one ounce of oh my gosh, you're not going to play lacrosse. You know, I mean, like he was so passionate about cycling. It wasn't even a question. It was like yes, you know, go move, go forward into cycling, and for him to have that sport daily that he still does as an adult, you know, 21 years old, and he's still out there um, cycling every day. The uh, My only complaint about that is, did he really have to uh, pick the one sport that's probably more expensive than lacrosse? Yep. <laughs> those, <laughs> those bikes those cost bikes a fortune. Yeah, yeah, they do. I never, I never want to hear about how expensive lacrosse is after I've done the cycling gig. Um, <laughs> And then heart, it's super fun to be back out there. Obviously, a very long hiatus for me. We have kids, our our kids. Uh, we just celebrated our twenty fifth wedding anniversary this this November. But um, wow. congratulations! Thank you. But we have kids that are very spread apart, um, and uh, it's super fun to be back out there with heart. And it, it you do have a completely different perspective of the whole thing. Um, when you've had this massive gap and you're out there for the, for the second time. And, you know, I mean, it's like, don't sweat the small stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I was never one of those people to have the, the crazy car ride home after a game when the player didn't play well, but I mean, you know, it's goofball status in the car after hearts <laughs> games, no matter how he plays. <laughs> nice. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun fun being an older parent, um, and having a lot of perspective on things. Yeah. And you've got a young goalie being coached by a goalie. Uh, how, how is that relationship? How do you observe that? I've been waiting to ask that question. Well, you know, it's funny. Chris is, he, he likes to take a step back and really not coach his kids, which I'm sure you, I mean, you know that, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a hard, that's a really hard 
thing to do at, to coach your own kids. And, um, so, you know, but they do lessons like a legit lesson out in the yard and um, stuff like that. But, you know, he, he enjoys it and Hart really loves it. Um, Christopher, a lot of times will get out there with them and do stuff as well. And, a lot of times they'll get me involved, although I'm, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm terrible. I, I get, com- I get complaints about my shots and they're not going to the right place. And I'm like, well, you know, why, why'd you ask me to play? <laughs> so well, you could tell that, him that's been fun. You... I think he's enjoyed having heart, uh, you know, do it. And who knows? I mean, zero pressure from Chris and Tiffany Saran on that kid continuing to a play lacrosse or even be a goalie. I mean, right. do what you want to do. And, and, you know, I, I think at this age, heart's age, your main goal as a parent should be having them fall in love with a sport, any sport, um, you know, and so they can play a sport in college in high school. I mean, you know, I think you want your kid involved in a sport in high school. And if it's lacrosse, great. And so I think we have always tried to um, put our best foot forward. Me on the organizational front by sending a gajillion emails a season to parents, um, helping them stay on top of things. And Chris on the field, um, you know, teaching lacrosse or coaching lacrosse in a positive way. Um, with Iron Horse and Deuces to try to, you know, get the kids engaged and loving the game so that they come back next season for the ultimate goal of stepping foot on the, high, the you know, wherever they go to high school, um, that campus, you know, day one um, and playing lacrosse for their high school and, you know, continuing to play all four years just to stay engaged in a, in a sport and stay out of, you know, other things that they could potentially get into. That's amazing. I, I love that philosophy. And as somebody who has worked with you and for you, that is 100% authentic. Tiffany, thanks yes. again for coming on. We're thrilled to have you on, fellow Q grad as we mentioned. So not quite making bagels, right? But for our snake in the draft, we're going to do something that everybody can relate to at lacrosse tournaments, the snacks that we have uh, during <laughs> lacrosse tournaments. So this will be a fun topic. We're going to, this is how it works, Tiffany. So you are our guest. You're going to have first pick. Uh, then we're going to go to, to Jordan, to Francis. Francis is going to pick again to Jordan. And then you get two picks back to back. Um, I'll make sure this flows kind of easily and and make sure it's uh, in order in this sense. Of it. We've been getting better with it, uh, Francis especially. He's our star pupil <laughs> in that sense. So, so we're going to start. Tiffany, uh, if you had to say, what is your favorite lacrosse tournament snack? Well, I'm just going off of years of travel with these boys, uh, high school boys flying up, uh, landing in Baltimore, uh, for Baltimore summer kickoff, going to Wegmans immediately yes. and, <laughs> and buying the Uncrustables PB and J's. Those Ooh, were strong. Yeah. Play. Those were the huge, I, I think they had to always buy them every, every time. Wow. So my, my one and a half year old loves Uncrustables. <laughs> And I could imagine that some preteens and teenage boys would uh, love some Uncrustables during the lacrosse tournament. That's a great pick. Nice. So that's a it qualifies as a pick your own, right? That is. That is a pick right, your own. And that's right. a great pick, honestly. I, that's a that's fuel, especially that's when a, that's you're a third game. Yeah, and the sun's beating <laughs> down, and you need something. Uncrustables, they always deliver. Jordan, you are up, sir. Okay. I'm going to go classic. I'm going to say oranges. Um, I, I think that's more of like the halftime snack, right? And you hope that that there is that option at halftime. Um, I always remember loving oranges at halftime when I was a kid. So I'm going to go with oranges. Okay. Awesome. Fair enough. Do you, do you, put, do you put the rind in your mouth and smile after? After you eat yeah, the you pretend or the peel when you're a kid. You pretend that yeah, you pretend that's your mouthpiece. Yeah, that's what 
<laughs> yeah, you pretend it's a mouthpiece. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick from the list here. I'm gonna start with trail mix. I'm a big trail mix fan. Big trail mix fan. Nutrient dense. Um, and then I think I'm gonna I'm gonna steal a pick your own, and I'm gonna go Chex Mix. Mm. Wow, that's very underrated. Upset. Francis, in yeah. terms of trail mix, are you a raisins guy? Raisins and trail mix? I'm definitely a raisins guy, yeah. M&M's? It, raisins and m and There's got to be like a, the raisin to M&M ratio, or more so the, the, the M&M to peanut ratio has to be even, if not heavier, on the M&M side. Yes. There we go. There we yeah. go. The chocolate's just a tough one on the summer circuit. <laughs> right? Mm. Exactly. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> <laughs> She has done this before. <laughs> She's a pro. We know this. Um, so it's going to go Jordan and then Tiffany. You're going to have two picks from that list. Okay. Okay. So first of all, I need to say this. So he just went trail mix and Chex mix. <laughs> I like my mix. Trail mix and Chex. He's a big Chex mix guy. Yeah. He's a big Chex mix guy. Um. So I'm going to go with, I had oranges, so I'm going to go granola bars. So you get that uh, fiber, something, <laughs> some more sustenance. But light, la last week we, uh, we talked about um, the routine, right? We were talking about our game day routine, and Francis was saying one thing he wished that he did in college was eat before games because sometimes he wouldn't eat because he didn't want to feel full. I feel like granola bars fit that bill. Probably. I feel like that's a good one. So oranges and granola bars. I'm losing this draft. Go on. <laughs> I guess if I have to go off of this list, um, I'm probably going to pick pretzels. Mm. Any particular kind? What's your favorite um, pretzel? The stick. Ooh, that's always a classic. Tiffany, yeah. you're a guest. If you wanna, if you wanna pick off the list, the floor is yours. I, no, I did pick off the list. That's pretzel. Or make whatever you whatever you prefer. You know, I mean, propel packets, but that's not really a snack. We just like to put it in our water. Yeah, no, Gatorade shoes. I don't really have another one. <laughs> I, 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 grapes or the, apples the, or? The classic is just when they just make really bad choices. And then, you know, I mean, <laughs> anything and everything has happened at these, uh, these, especially the youth tournaments. The bad choices seem to abound during the snack time. Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Three yeah. hamburgers and then two <laughs> Snickers nauseous. bars and the Gatorade. And then they want to come out after the first quarter. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, to you, sir. So it's down to grapes and apples, right? Popcorn's still up there. All right. Grapes. Oh, and popcorn. And popcorn. All right. I'm going to go. I have granola bars and oranges. Um, like you need some fruit. Yeah, I'll go pop I'll go popcorn. Oh wow. I'll go popcorn. I have fruit, I have granola bar, and I have popcorn, which is like a, more of probably a bad choice snack. But I'm a you know, I'm a bad choice snack kind of guy. What can I say? I I was waiting for tacos on there, like something like that. I I could get down, with some, maybe not as a as a coach, you know, like grab some tacos. Yeah, agreed. Um, flavor popcorn flavor though, you can go a lot of different ways. You can. I'd probably just go with regular, like kettle corn, Ooh. maybe like the Lake Placid okay. kettle corn. The Lake Placid and, kettle and, corn. And what I Ooh. right? Yeah. Right. So <laughs> yes. that's what I'm saying. So so. And I just continued our streak of mentioning Lake Placid in every single episode we've <laughs> yes. had so far. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> if there's if there's something we talk about every week, it's Syracuse and Lake Placid, probably. <laughs> so we, I, I actually think about that lemonade stand they have, too, there. Every, oh, oh yeah. I just love that freshly squeezed lemonade that they have. Oh, my goodness. All right. I got I to gotta finish this. I got to eat dinner. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go grapes. I'm gonna go grapes. Yeah, yeah, always sure, a classic. Sure. Always a yeah, classic. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to round it out. I think my favorite answer was Tiffany. Just, just don't make bad decisions. Just don't. <laughs> don't do something <laughs> stupid and, and throw up. And, yeah, make it memorable for everyone. But, yes. But excellent, Tiffany. Thank you for for participating. Uh, appreciate it. And this goes without saying. Go Cues.
And yes. thanks for having <laughs> you. Thanks for coming on the pod and uh, playing this with us. Thank you so much thanks, for Ron. having me, guys. It was really fun.